Hey everyone, this is Hogan Gidley. Today, Chad Wolf and I will sit down with former Congressman Lee Zeldin to discuss his time in Congress and the policies he focused on for his recent gubernatorial race in the state of New York. Welcome to The Tank. Coming to you from our nation's capital, this is The Tank, your voice in Washington, D.C. and around the country. Broadcasting from the America First Policy Institute offices in D.C., this is the premier think tank podcast where we discuss the challenges facing our nation, talk policy, and advance America First solutions. Welcome to The Tank. Hello, this is Chad Wolf, And this is Hogan Gidley. Well, Hogan, coming up, we're going to sit down with former Congressman Lee Zeldin. But before we do that, let's jump into a few issues I know that are on the top of my mind, your mind, and, and many Americans as well. And we'll just jump right into it. Sound of Freedom. Now, we've done a couple of um, episodes on this. We interviewed Bob Anonway, CEO of Goya Foods. Uh, the movie just continues to be gangbusters, right? Continues to break records. I think it's uh, surpassed $148 million Unreal. in box office revenue. And I think, you know, from my perspective, this movie alone has put more attention on this issue uh, for millions of Americans, everyday Americans, than anything I think that the the federal government or anyone else for that matter. I mean, I spent a lot of my four years at Homeland Security talking about sex trafficking and human trafficking, and it was hard to break through. And I, I've seen that this movie has been able to break through in ways that that you know politicians and policymakers never could. You're right. Um, it's a it's a really horrific issue that occurs uh, all over the world. Uh, it's something that we know is real. Uh, we know that it impacts families everywhere. Uh, it's grotesque what happens to these young children. And what fascinates me about it is, with really no assistance, if you will, by members of the mainstream media or um, you know any of the the powers that be out there, this film, uh, while again had a lot of support in a lot of little pockets around the country, has outperformed anybody's yeah. expectations. And in large measure has been tried, uh, has been uh, has been censored uh, by some of the mainstream media, who act as though this issue of child trafficking, um, selling children into sex slavery, is not a real thing. Th- this this movie, Sound of Freedom, is literally based on a true story. There have been times where uh, I think it was uh, one of the networks did um, a, a story on Sound of Freedom, talking about how bad of an issue it was. But when it comes forward, uh, this is years ago, when it actually comes forward and, and begins to be um, um, kind of pushed out there and, and people get to see it, all of a sudden they act like, oh, there's nothing to yeah. see here. It's not, a real, it's not a real issue facing America. It's not a real issue in the world. It's a serious issue, and you had to deal with it yeah. all the time. Yeah, it's 100% serious, and I think I said this on the last episode, but I think this is where the left comes at this, right? We've been talking about, when I say we, I would say the right and conservatives have been talking about this issue for two years now because of what we see on the border. And I think that's in part why elite Hollywood and others don't want to talk about this issue because it elevates the deficiency of the Biden administration, really what they've done on this border. So instead of talking about the issue, they want to talk about all the different actors in the movie and try to tear them down as a way to discredit the movie without talking about the issue, because they know if they are talking about this issue, that politically they're losing. And I think they're they're in bed just like big media and everything else is uh, with the current administration. So I think it continues to be a very interesting issue. It it does. But let me, if I can, talk about policies, because obviously that's what we do here. What policies should be in place? What policies are in place, maybe that aren't being followed, that this current administration just isn't isn't actually doing its job to protect these children? (laughs) Uh, we've got a whole host. I'm not sure we've got enough time, Hogan. I would just say every time that you tear down a successful policy along the border and you don't replace it with anything, you are enabling human trafficking traffickers to do their job. They're looking for ways to smuggle and traffic individuals across that border. And so whether there's no uh, effective border wall system, there's no Remain in Mexico program, uh, you are instituting catch and release. All of these things are incentives that the traffickers use to entice individuals to put their lives in their hands and to get them across the border in a variety of different ways. So it's not just one thing. There's not one policy that stops human trafficking, but it is a network and a patchwork of policies um, that you you want to put in place that don't enable 
uh, the traffickers to do their job. And that's why I think you just hit on something the left is so angry about this, because the current policies enable this type of uh, illegal activity, enable children um, to face some of the most, you know, horrific acts on the face of the planet. And they don't want to talk about that. That's right. That's exactly right. Well, we'll look, we'll continue to, to monitor the movie. I think it's going to continue to grow. We just hosted, I would say, the America First Policy Institute just hosted a screening of the, the movie here in the past several days here in D.C. on the uh, on the hills of a very successful human trafficking conference. Um, so, look, we continue to get the word out because it's an important issue, so we'll stay involved in that. But let me uh, go from one segment of the entertainment industry to another uh, go from Hollywood to uh, Nashville here, and we talk about Jason Aldean, a very successful country music uh, artist here who has a song uh, called Try That in a Small Town that's getting a little little notice, probably for things that uh, maybe Jason didn't think it was going to get noticed for when he recorded it. But uh, this is a song that really talks about what life is like in a small town and, and how they wouldn't put up with some of the nonsense. It's the best way I know how to put it of what we've seen in the past couple of years, whether it's, you know, uh, attacking police officers or rioting or whatever it might be. The song is just sort of like, you know, look, in a small town, that's not going to cut it. We, you know, we're going to take care of people regardless of who they are. Uh, we're not going to tear them down. And, and for all that, the left has come at him hard. Yeah, the song is basically a I wish you would <laughs> try that in, in, in right. my town. Um we saw what happened with with riots and and looting, fires being started, as you just mentioned, police officers being targeted, and in large cities that was kind of the norm for a long time, for months on end. Um, they even set up their own little private areas in in the northwest, the Chaz Chop Zones, as you'll recall, where there was complete and total lawlessness, and there were stories coming out about rapes and other things that were kind of the norm. And basically this song, um, written by a, a country singer who's been famous for a long time with a lot of good hits, um, it's been out for months, and then all of a sudden the left just jumps all over it. Um, and they made all types of accusations that were ridiculous um, and, and weren't true. Uh, but the fact is, um, he really does point to the essence of how, you know, even even big towns used to be like this, even cities used to be this way, where you would look out for each other. And if you saw someone violating the law, if you saw someone, um, you know, doing something to a fellow citizen, you'd step in and help. Yeah, that was what it was all about because you cared about a civil society, you cared about peace, and for whatever reason, now it's become so normal, so commonplace to see these types of violent uh, behaviors and this lawlessness that a lot of times people just pass right by and don't even think about it. Yeah. And so I think he really struck a chord, um, he, and that was not a pun, by the way, that was real. <laughs> he really did with the American psyche on this. And when you see someone like Lee Greenwood, who writes, um, you know, uh, God Bless USA, obviously one of his famous songs, uh, he had some interesting quotes, too. He said, it's about a small town flavor. I'm from a small town in California. You know what? People cannot take our freedom away because people know everybody in a small town. That's what the heart of America is. It's rural America. You can't take freedom away. And that was what I thought was interesting was he was saying, we know each other in a small town, so we're always going to stand up for anybody, regardless of your race or your religion. That's what it's about. I thought that was really cool. Well, if you live in New York or you live on the coast, whether it's the East Coast or West Coast, you don't live in a small town, and so you don't have the same perspective. And so that's where I think a lot of the the folks from the left are, are coming at. And this is just another form, right? We've seen it in the past, of cancel culture trying to cancel Jason in this case, uh, his song. And, and so I, I like to see folks from basically all sides coming to his defense saying, look, guys, you're taking this way too far as you've taken many other things. And what we've heard, seen and heard from time to time is diversity of thought as long as you think like a certain segment of folks. And so they can't even allow a song that maybe they don't agree with. I got it. Not everyone agrees with every song written. But to take it so far in the way that they have is, again, over the, over the top. You know, but here's what's interesting, because we were just talking about Sound of Freedom, the, the movie, and it's an, it, it provides an inconvenient set of facts for the left that the border's a mess, um, and so it allows for this type of behavior. Yeah. The same thing applies here for this song. It highlights an inconvenient set of facts where some of the policies in these big cities allow for these criminals to commit acts of violence, and then they're let right back out on the street— 
So why would you not keep doing that? I think the point of the song, again, is to say, no, you can't do that in a town where you have a community that's so close-knit. And while the left tries to make it about race, it's clearly not. No. I mean, I've listened to the song. I know yeah. the lyrics, et cetera. And I loved uh, Vivek Ramaswamy made a comment, too, that I thought was really fascinating. He, he basically points to the fact that uh, Jason Aldean, he wrote this song, he defended the values that all Americans used to share, faith, family, hard work, patriotism, um, and and then, of course, he, he faced the cancellation. But he also made an interesting, interesting note here that Vivek went on to say that these are some of the same people, obviously the ones who hate this song, who cheer on songs like Cop Killer and the glorification of sex and violence in hip-hop. They're the ones who stand against this type of song. And, and for me... It's almost as though sometimes they just the left wants to be mad at something, so they have to make invent something to be mad about. It's kind of a a sign of a very comfortable country. Yeah, um, we're, we're we're a wealth of riches here, and so they got to invent things to be mad at. I think this is a good example of that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's a it's a shame. It's not surprising, uh, but nevertheless, it's uh, something to keep our eye on. Sure. And uh, speaking of keeping your eye on things. Um, something else is going on kind of in the, the realm of, of uh, the, the U.S. courts and um, some of the, uh, the uh, folks that are monitoring weaponization and other things like we are here at, at AFPI. But um, the, the Hunter Biden, the former, um, or the son, rather, of the, of the sitting president of the United States, Joe Biden, had an interesting day in court where he was kind of set up to go in and, and face uh, two charges, which he was going to plead guilty to. One had to do with guns. One had to do with tax evasion. And in the course of that proceeding, in essence, what happened was a provision which basically gave Hunter Biden immunity for anything coming down the pike potentially was slipped in to one of the pleas that had nothing to do with the actual charge itself. So he was facing this tax crime charge, and where you would put that immunity piece in would be the tax violation because it dealt with further crimes uh, of which he's under investigation for, according to the DOJ. But they put it in the gun charge, so they hit it. And when the judge started asking questions about it, the whole thing just kind of fell apart. And instead of pleading guilty to both of these crimes, like was the plan, and then he was going to be able to, to go through a deferral program and keep his gun and the whole thing and, and have this immunity, he ended up pleading guilty instead, or not guilty instead, walked out, and the whole thing blew up, and they got to come back in 30 days. So it, the whole thing is, is kind of confusing and layered, but it does point back to kind of one of the bigger issues we've been focused on here in the last little bit. It is the weaponization of the federal government the weaponization of these three-letter agencies on everyday citizens. And it's not just who they decide to prosecute, it's who they decide to protect. Yeah, it's a good point. Look, I think a lot of Americans, and we've talked about this over the past couple of years now, have seen this two-tier system of justice, and they're just shaking their head. And I would say that, you know, when this, as you indicated, this kind of fell apart, people said, well, maybe there's actually, maybe there's some light at the end of the tunnel. Maybe we're actually holding people accountable that need to be held accountable. Now, look, it, it could all come back together after they come back and, and sort it out. But I think the judge asked some basic questions that most Americans were asking, too, which is, can he, you know, can you still prosecute him for other crimes? Or has he got immunity across the board for everything and anything? And and people intuitively know that that's not right. And, and just some basic questions from the judge, I think, unraveled this all. But I, I think, again, you know, a lot of folks that I talk to, you know, just kind of say, okay, well, maybe there is some help here uh, along the way that we are holding people accountable to the law. And just because they are are part of one team or, or one political party, they don't get a pass. I'm not sure that that's going to be the case in the long run here, uh, but that's where we stand right now. Right. And I think what was so fascinating as you talk about people out there kind of watching this from the outside, the ones who are paying attention going, wait a minute, this is this is this doesn't seem right. It kind of stinks. It's it's confusing to most people, and it was confusing to the judge, too, when the judge brought up the point to the attorneys, have, has a deal like this ever been structured before? We have we researched it on our side and couldn't find it. Are you basing this on anything? And basically the response was, 
No, we've never seen anything like this either. Admitting this was kind of done because of who the defendant was in this particular instance, the son yeah. of a sitting president. And so I think you hit on a word that has been so frustrating for so many Americans, and it's that accountability piece. Right. When are people who are doing the wrong thing going to be held accountable, just like every else w- everybody else would be? If you violate the law, you should face those consequences. And I don't think it's too much to ask for the American people just to say, wait a minute. If I'm exercising my First Amendment right to protest peacefully outside of an abortion clinic and I get arrested, what's the problem? If I stand up and ask, why are my children being taught you know, critical race theory in school, or why are you trying to trans my child behind my back and you get arrested— where's where's the you know where's the freedom in that so a lot of people are getting um pushed around uh, not just a former president by the way but um everyday citizens and so when you see these things happen time and time again the question then really does become why are there two tiers of justice why are there um you know a dual system yeah that, that benefits some and not others, that protects some and not others? And it's a legitimate question. Yeah, it's, a, it's certainly a legitimate question. It's not an easy one to answer. Um, a lot of our work here at AFPI kind of is geared towards, though, trying to answer that, trying to understand what is at the root of this. Is it, is it just because there are certain individuals in, in high uh, office that are making decisions, or is it more structural at a place like the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the Department of Justice. But it's not just there. It's in a lot of these agencies and departments that you know we worked in previously that have this view that they're going to protect one side over the other um, that uh, we need to really sort of deconstruct and get into. And a lot, again, a lot of the work we're doing here at AFPI now and over the next, I would say, 12 to 14 months is designed just to do that. So more to come on this. Yeah, and you got to draw attention to it. That's first and foremost because you have to explain to the people why there's a need yeah. um, for policy solutions that we we've helped kind of develop and design. And the fact is, I think at this point people are starting to see. Wait, there's a need. <laughs> we've seen it now for several years, and so uh, it's important here at AFPI for us to continue to take a look at the weaponization piece and and figure out the best yeah. the best means and modes forward to to get something done to protect people, uh, all people equally. Yeah. Well, today on The Tank, we're honored to host Congressman Lee Zeldin. Uh, He's in the studio. The congressman has been a pioneer in the America First movement and really just a powerful voice in in Republican politics. Congressman was elected uh, in 2014, played an integral role in advancing the interest of the people of New York's first congressional district, serving on a variety of different committees, foreign uh, financial services, foreign affairs. He resigned from Congress, probably the smartest move he may have made. (laughs) He resigned to Congress to run for governor of New York. Uh, and his performance in that race was remarkable, probably by any any metric, a true bright spot in 2022 and received the highest percentage of vote for a Republican candidate uh, for the New York governor really since 2002 and probably principally responsible for flipping uh, four different congressional seats uh, because of his, um, his uh, results there in New York. Finally, let me uh, just say and, and thank you for your service. Lieutenant Colonel in the U.S. Army Reserve spent four years on active duty in the 82nd Airborne Division, paratrooper in Iraq. So thank you for that. Thank you for your service and everything that you've done, not only in the military, but in Congress um, and trying to trying to rescue the, the great state of New York. Uh, Congressman, welcome to the tank. That's great to be with both can of we, you guys. Can we clap? Yeah, can we, clap? Right. Well, there we you can go. do that. We there can you do go. that. Good, good. Well, let me, let me just start off. Obviously, you spent most of your adult life serving the country one way or another. What, what is it that, that calls you to service? Um, you know, I think we've talked with a lot of folks, certainly military service is usually ingrained, usually have family members, part of the military, and that's just kind of how you were, you were brought up in a sense. But you have a lot of political service as well, um, and that's a different type of service. So talk to us a little bit about what, what draws you to that. I have this photo. I'm about two years old. I'm at Camp Pendleton with my uncle, my mother's brother, who was in the Marine Corps doing my first sit-up. I was wearing those short shorts, <laughs> those uh, those tall socks with those uh, well, color stripes. Well, today, so we're good. <laughs> it's, it never went out of style. Never. Yeah, and uh, 
it was just something within the family, service to country. And for me, I strongly believe that despite whoever is in charge at any given moment that we live in the greatest country in the history of the world, we have challenges. We have a Amen. lot to talk about. Uh, but this is an exceptional nation. That I remember the first time that I had a military uniform on and I'm looking at the mirror and I see the, the U.S. Army patch smiling back at me. And thinking about all the people who have worn that uniform before me, uh, all the generations who have given up everything, saved the world. Do you think of the greatest generation, what that Absolutely. map of yeah. Europe looked like when Nazi Germany was extended to its furthest borders? For me, uh, service is a way that I define success in life. For some people, they uh, might define success in some material ways. Uh, and everyone is entitled to define success however they want. Uh, but I know that uh, something that uh, really brings a lot of people together here at AFBI yeah. is service to country and believing in a cause greater than yourself and defining success about leaving this world better than you found it. Uh, so for me, success uh, is very much tied to just being able to serve uh, in the military or however else I can make a positive impact. Well, it's such a great message because I think – a lot of young people today, um, I'm not sure they have that same outlook in life, right? They, they are being taught and told, and whether it's schools or in the media, mainstream media and others, that, you know, maybe this country isn't as great as everyone says it to be. You know, it's racist. It's uh, systemically racist. It's, it's all these other things. But I think hearing voices like yours and others to say, no, you know, we may have some faults. We're not perfect, but it's still the greatest country out there. And to serve that country and to give back whether it's in the military or maybe it's political service or some other type of service, volunteers, you know, that, that is actually the right thing to do to put, you know, country above self. And it really should be a message that is universal, that unites everybody. And it doesn't matter your politics. It doesn't matter. It used to be, right? Didn't it, it used to be? Not kind of, that long ago. Right. <laughs> and we, we've reached that point where inside of classrooms, teachers are taking a liberty hmm. to brainwash to indoctrinate kids in a way that it, it turns them against community, turns them against others in the classroom, turns people against country. And we have to understand while we might be out of school, all of us, you know, we have kids and my daughter's just finished 11th grade. Uh, we have young kids right now in classrooms across this country where there really is a battle going on oh, yeah. for, the future of what our kids believe, not what they know. That was what education in many respects, it was about what you learned, mathematics and history and whatnot. Now it's about how, how you're thinking in an ideological way as if you're trying to raise more liberals as part of the process. Yeah, and I've often said that it's the left that controls all the levers of power and influence in this country, the major ones, colleges, universities, of course, the school systems, uh, the media, Hollywood, big tech, et cetera. And so they're being indoctrinated. They often don't have a chance um, to, to, you know, begin to figure out how great this country is because they've been told it, the exact opposite, which really kind of brings me to, to the second question, because you've, you've now run for office multiple times. Um, I would imagine what you were talking about for Congress wasn't necessarily the same things you were talking about um, as you're running for governor in, in uh, New York, but you also reached out to different communities. You began to build coalitions I don't think a lot of people expected you to do. Um, talk about, if you can, some of the policies that you really focused on that were important to the people uh, in New York, how you thought that resonated, and what were those issues and what were those policy sets that they really wanted um, in place that would really improve their lives? It was a real simple question that we asked ourselves at the beginning of the governor's race. Why are so many people leaving New York? Why does New York lead the country in out-migration, a battle that goes on between New York and California? Why are New Yorkers hitting their breaking point and fleeing? And my belief, our answer was that people are leaving because they feel like their, their wallet, their safety, their freedom were under attack. We're coming out of COVID. You're seeing the COVID mandates. Um, causing a lot of New Yorkers of all stripes to to change their behaviors and their their outlook on local and state government. People who are struggling to afford to survive in New York, realizing that their money will go further in places like Florida or Texas or Tennessee or the Carolinas. Uh, people who don't feel safe on the streets, but they feel like they'll live life safer elsewhere outside of New York. 
So while there are all sorts of issues in there, crime and public safety, the economy, we talk about education and freedom, ultimately it comes down to the question of why are so many New Yorkers hitting their breaking point and fleeing? And the people who haven't left yet, why are so many people planning on taking off themselves? Now, I believe that conservatives need to challenge themselves to go speak to people who they haven't spoken to ever. Uh, when you're told to stay away from a particular area because there's no way that they'll ever vote for you, that should be a sign that that's exactly where you need to show up because yeah. that means mm -hmm. that conservatives probably hadn't been there in a very long time. So I would say that our, our message, which uh, was very much grounded in substance and policy of how to take a state like New York in a much better direction, uh, was also about bringing that message not just to the people who agree with you the most, but the people who aren't going to ever learn who we are, what we stand for, unless we show up to talk to them in person. And by the way, once you show up, you need to keep showing up. Right. I think something you're hitting on there is important to me uh, for many reasons. Look, I, I've been in politics for a long time. I worked for Mike Huckabee when he was governor of Arkansas. And, um, you know, he was the first Republican in, in history of the country. In fact, still remains to this day. He got 50% of the black vote. I mean, Tim Scott's black. He got 14% in South Carolina. And in large measure, it's because he went into those communities and addressed issues that they had, but didn't do it just during election years. Went there all the time to open conversations and have debates about the policy. And I'm embarrassed to say it, but when I was in the White House, I... I I didn't even realize how impactful and how important policy was to the average person because I didn't realize how much it really did affect their lives. And so what I'm hearing you say is that when you went around, you talked about the issues that really are, are popular amongst all demographics, regardless of race, religion, color, or creed. These are issues that really answer the question, are you better off now than you were before? And if you're not, that's why I think you're saying that's why so many people were looking around going, do I really want to stay in a state that has policies on the books that really hurt my chances for a better future and for that of my children? Is that is that correct? Oh, yeah, spot on. And you now have the answer to this fundamental question, why are so many people leaving? You tactically now know that you need to get into areas that conservatives haven't been to in a long time and talk to people who haven't been spoken to in a long time, not just by the way, conservatives, but also Democrats, because what you find is that Republicans aren't going to areas under the theory that even if I show up, I won't get their vote. But Democrats aren't showing up to those areas either because they believe that they don't have to. They'll get their vote anyways. Now, when you look at the individual groups, maybe there's a slight variation to the issue based off who you're talking to. So if you're talking to Asian American voters, they might be majority Democrat. However, they are seeing members of their own community being murdered in New York with anti-Asian hate pushed in front of an oncoming subway car, stabbed to death in their apartment wow. in lower Manhattan, beaten to death on the street with a hammer. All of this united the Asian American community against anti-Asian hate, but also raised their awareness of, okay, what is cashless bail? Who's Alvin Bragg? They start paying attention to these other crime-related issues. They care about economy. They care about education. Now, when you talk to a Hispanic parent, it's possible that they might care more about school choice. They might care about their kid trapped in multi-generational poverty. When you talk to that black parent, they might be more concerned about lifting their son or daughter out of multi-generational poverty so that they're no longer stuck in a poor-performing public school. For that Asian-American parent... For them, it might be more of a concern about attacks on um, the, the ability to enter specialized schools, wanting to get rid of merit-based entry into specialized schools, maybe wanting to get rid of advanced academics under the theory of de Blasio and others that it wasn't fair to the kids yeah. who weren't performing at that level. Uh, so I think it's important uh, in, in understanding that we need to talk about crime, we need to talk about education, we need to talk about the economy, but then also understand who you're talking to and and really engage and listen to them. Yeah. Uh, I found that people are waiting with open arms because the average person out there, the average person out there 
have they have not had a conversation with anyone in politics, with any candidates, with any uh, elected officials. So just the fact you walked in the front door gives you a leg up. Now it's time to engage in a deeply substantive conversation, listening to them and, and providing solutions. And not, and by the way, not pandering either. It's not yeah. about showing up and saying, I love Asian people, vote for me. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I have an Asian American family. My, my wife is Asian American. Uh, I, you know, we would have had the first Asian American first family in New York. Yeah, when I'm in Flushing, Queens or f uh, Sunset Park in Brooklyn or in Chinatown in Manhattan, maybe part of the conversation, that's something that was an interesting side point. Yeah. But there are other candidates out there who would be like, w you have to vote for me. Yeah. My wife is Asian American. So therefore, end of conversation, uh, you know, I demand your vote. And if you don't vote for me, then you're not Asian American, which is, you know, what Joe Biden said when he said, if you're not, you know, if you don't vote for me, you're not black. Right. right. I think you might have said that uh, on The Breakfast Club, if I'm not mistaken, with uh, Charlemagne the God. It, that's pandering and it shouldn't work. No, I think that's exactly right. Look, one of the issues you, in the wallet, the safety and the freedom that you talk about, I think that's spot on, not just for uh, you know, a state like New York, but probably nationally as well. Those are three big issues that um, I think many, many Americans care about. Let's talk about crime, though, because obviously that was a, a key component um, in your race. And I think, as you indicate, what a lot of people in New York care about. But again, people across the country care about that. What, um, you know, in, in your mind, whether it's just there in New York or it's nationally, you know, what what's the focus there? Is it the, is it the defund the movement that we saw really pick up pace and, and speed in 2020? Is it the progressive or woke prosecutors who refuse to actually enforce the law? What's at the heart of, you know, this crime issue that still continues to grip America that I don't think that we've really quite understand how certain communities, New York City is probably one of them, right? Chicago and other big cities are really grappling with this. It's nothing that you can solve overnight, I assume, um, because a lot of these stem from some fundamental issues that I think the far left has taken on. There are three components of this that we really need to wrap our head around entirely. And it's not difficult for us to understand what the the left's attack on law-abiding uh, New Yorkers, law-abiding Americans yeah. uh, is, is all about. And one is a push to pass pro-criminal laws. So in New York, right. they passed cashless bail. Yeah. Some called less is more, raise the age, the halt act. There are these these names of these different laws that are uh, really turning the system over to turning certain streets over to criminals, turning certain prisons over to criminals. But did you find that most New Yorkans, I mean, New York folks knew about that? I mean, so or, they, or is it just a small elite of people making these policies that are driving that? Very, uh, very high awareness on cashless bail. Uh, if you have a correction officer in a family yeah. or you live in a community with prisons, the HALT Act, uh, that really took away the tool of solitary confinement to keep order inside of prisons. They keep going. Uh, the Democrats and all of them just passed something called the Clean Slate Act, wiping away criminal records from wow. all sorts of New Yorkers. Now, if, if you want to hire someone, you might want to know that they have a criminal background. If you're going to rent out... A, an apartment of yours, maybe you want to know about crimes that they have had committed. So this first prong is about these pro-criminal laws. Part of our responsibility here is to educate people as to what kind of laws are getting passed or what kind of new laws are being proposed. The second piece uh, of that is that you have weak prosecutors who are getting elected, people who are refusing to enforce the law. Yeah. Alvin Bragg in Manhattan is the perfect example. And uh, there are more of these prosecutors who view themselves more as a district uh, as a defense attorney than being there to prosecute. Uh, and then the third piece is that we need to support our men and women in law enforcement. Yeah. And if you want to secure our Southern border, we can talk policy, you know, finish construction of the border wall and catch and release and force to remain in Mexico policy. But I believe that one of the components that need to be part of this conversation, support our customs and border patrol agents. Yeah. And uh, don't don't attack them for for doing their jobs. So I would I look at this as three pronged. I look at, at about the pro criminal laws that are being passed, uh, the weak prosecutors who are getting into office or trying to get into office, and the need to support our men and women in blue. Yeah. 
Well, you, I, Hogan, just real quick, I, we couldn't agree with you more. It's certainly here at AFPI, our Center for Law and Justice, we're, we're taking on a lot of that, right? And, and particularly, you, you know, we brought up, we talked about woke prosecutors and, and what can you do as a citizen, right, um, to, to make some change. And every state's a little different, right? You can remove them differently perhaps in Florida than you can in New York and, and elsewhere. And so what we're trying to do here at AFPI is to give a toolkit to every state to say, okay, if you've got woke prosecutors out there, and you don't like what they're doing, here are some ways to hold them accountable. So I think that's really, really important. Yeah, and one thing you hit on there that I, I if you if you would, expand out a little bit with me, and that is because I'm a messenger and I pay attention to things like this, I think the way the left has kind of taken over the naming of a lot of their projects, the naming of, of a lot of their bills, just instills support just by hearing it out loud. The Hall Tax sounds great. Clean slate? My goodness, everyone loves a clean slate. Did you find it was difficult on on your various campaigns to have conversations with constituents who thought because of the name of something, boy, that sounds like a good thing for me. And then when you unpack it, they're like, wait a minute, that doesn't even do, you, you think of something like the Inflation Reduction Act, when they all admit it doesn't reduce any inflation. In fact, it adds to it. Those types of things where we seed the ground, it's not necessarily messaging or talking points, but it's just the name of something itself implies that a particular piece of legislation, a particular law will do X when in fact it does Y. How difficult is it to fight back on that? The left is so much better than the right in this aspect of branding initiatives. And it's to their credit. Uh, I remember when I first got elected to the state Senate, I was proposing a bill in Albany that would help New York's craft breweries, and it was a it was a real can bill. Can we have a can we can we start a center here for craft beers brewery. Yeah. and craft brewery? A center for craft beer? I'd love that. Go ahead. It, Sorry. it was uh, it was a this industry a dozen years ago that was really starting to pop big time in New York, and we were going to do a press conference and. Schumer wants to introduce a federal version of our bill. Now, I just got elected to the state Senate, haven't really learned as much as I've now learned since about the need to successfully brand these initiatives. I don't even remember the name of my bill. Now, my bill actually became law. Schumer's bill never became law. But I remember at the press conference, his bill was the B-E-E-R Act, the Beer Act. Yes. It's brilliant. Like brilliant. why did, why That's did so we not do this yeah. on on our bill? I would say that in New York, uh and it was a couple years later, they passed uh this anti second amendment bill called the Safe Act. And it was right after Sandy Hook and there's this raw emotion right after an incident like that and I remember this rush to pass it and they call it the SAFE Act, and it did not matter yeah. what was in it right. for so many New Yorkers. And if you oppose it, the the average New Yorker said, how can you possibly oppose yeah. a bill that's yeah, called safe the SAFE Act? And, and when you actually have a conversation with folks about what's in it, what does it mean, then you can start easily being able to win folks over but you have to have that conversation. Uh, I would also say that sometimes the Democrats, when they have all levels of power, like they they do up in Albany, some of those bills, they might have branded it well, but they passed it so quickly without much vetting, without much opposition, that we found that the average New Yorker didn't know what yeah. raise the age or less is more was Actually, because it just passed through originally so fast. I remember, I know we got to wrap up here, but I, I remember Rush Limbaugh always used to say on his radio program, if he put a bill in, in, in Congress, he would call it the Martin Luther King Jr. bill. He goes, it may not have anything to do with Martin Luther King Jr., but who's going to vote against a bill named Martin Luther King Jr. bill, right? And so it's funny to me to hear that because, you know, you, you, win, the, you win the message, you win the title, you win the war in a lot of ways. And so obviously the words we use carry meaning. Well, we're so grateful for your time. I got I got one uh, last question here for you, and it's kind of a, a, a broader question. You, look, you're obviously still much very involved in the fight here. Um, as you look forward to you know where the movement is going, uh, how to sort of take back the country and, and all these things. What you know, if what would you say are the one, two, uh, maybe top three challenges the movement faces today? Either, you know, from a policy perspective or maybe maybe it is the branding. Maybe it's the communications challenge that we have. We don't have 
you know, we have some media, but not not the the mainstream. Um, so, what would you say as you look forward? You know, here's what the movement faces um, in the next three to five. I think to add to what we were just been talking about for the last few minutes, communication is yeah, key. I'd agree. Uh, I will tell you that the way that elections are run, uh, if I had to rank a list, it would be number one. Hogan, now he's well, talking your talk. Lee and I have been on a panel on this very topic before, so <laughs> he's, he's preaching to the choir here. Gotcha. And you can have the right message. You can have the right ideals. You can have the better candidate. Uh, the timing can be right. All of uh, what you would think is needed for a successful campaign if at the end of the day you're in a state that just recently legalized yeah. ballot harvesting and early voting and you decide that you're not going to lean into those laws and you're just praying that come election day there isn't going to be a snowstorm in Reno, then you're going to lose a Senate seat. Yeah. And uh, I, I would say that that is the biggest challenge that we face right now. Uh, and, and it's multidimensional. Uh, in many ways, you can't stop... Uh, working on this until the last ballot is counted. But you have to start well before Election Day when some of these changes are being proposed. Yep. It might be in the courts. It might be with the legislature. It might be in the executive branch. It might be with some local county elections commissioner. And I would say the third piece is mentality. Uh, there were just too many people in 2022 who were talking red wave, red tsunami, and weren't actually doing anything to deliver right. it. I have no problem with, I mean, optimism is a good thing. If if you're in the fight all in until the last ballot is counted and you want to say, I believe that there's going to be a red wave, God bless you, you're doing everything in your power to make sure it happens. Uh, but if we are communicating brilliantly, if we're communicating better, letting people not just know what we're against, but also know what, what, they're, what we're for in the entire process of uh, how this plays out. And right now there are more changes I'm sure they'll get uh, proposed between now and November 2024. And third is just having the mentality that every single vote matters. Yeah. Uh, there's so mu uh, so many people, millions of Americans who know that they need to do more. And I think it's important for us to convey the message to them that the rest of us are relying on them yeah. to yeah. get up, to yeah. step up and make a difference. The more local the government, the easier it is to effectuate change. No question about yeah. it. Well, That's absolutely. Not only does every vote count, but we got to count them correctly. Yes. Too, every right? legal vote, every legal voter. That's what we're trying to do. There you go. Well, Congressman, I know your time is limited. So thank you so much for joining us here on The Tank. Uh, thank you for your insights, uh, but also for your service to the country. Uh, thank you. For really yours. appreciate it. Really Make appreciate sure it. to subscribe today so you don't miss any of the upcoming episodes. And we'll see you next time on The Tank. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Text the word tank to 70107. That's tank to 70107 to get exclusive content from the Tank Podcast and to learn more about the America First Policy Institute.